Good morning. This is Scott from the Apogee team, and we're delighted to sponsor today's webinar with Dan Jacobson and Mike Hart from Netflix. Mike and Dan have some great content for us today about the, the role of the Netflix API and the evolution of the API in Netflix's uh, huge success over the last couple of years. They also have some, uh, some great stuff about where the API is headed. But before we start, a couple of housekeeping items. First, uh, there's a call in that uh, you, can, uh, you can use below for audio. Secondly, Dan and Mike have asked me to remind you that uh, they're hiring for the Netflix API engineering team. I'm sure they'll talk more about that if you like what you see. And thirdly, if you do like working with APIs, we hope you'll check out Apogee's free API tools for developers. And we also have an enterprise API platform for providers like Netflix. So without further delay, I uh, would like to introduce Mike and Dan from Netflix. Thanks. Hi, uh, Michael Hart here, uh, former director of engineering for the API and current director of engineering for social systems here at Netflix. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, the evolution of the API strategy up till now at Netflix, and Daniel is going to take us to the future shortly thereafter. Um, to kick off the presentation, uh, the first point I'd like to make is that the API strategy, like, like any strategy, is only valid in a particular business context. Opportunities and constraints within each business operate. So your mileage may vary. The initial phase of our API strategy could be called a thousand flowers, as in let a thousand flowers bloom. The inspiration for this came from the same inspiration as the Netflix Prize, which was an attempt to outsource some aspects of innovation around recommendations here at Netflix. The idea behind the prize is that teams could compete to improve upon the results of our own recommendation uh, by 10%. And if they met that goal, there was a million dollar prize. Uh, um, you know, it actually took thousands of teams three years to uh, actually hit that goal, which I think is you know, a testament to not only our ability to outsource some aspects of our innovation, but also our own ability to innovate. And it took you know, three years and thousands of teams to hit that goal. Outsourcing some aspects of innovation is just one of the many ways Netflix tries to stay small think about ourselves as a big startup at the end of the day. Um, this slide is something I showed at the Business of API conference two years ago, showing a range of potential partners at the time from large to small. The idea was, could we recre recreate the same innovation dynamic around an API as we did with Netflix Prize, enabling some external innovation around our API to create user experiences that would improve movie now TV show discovery especially by enabling the smaller developers down the tail to have an equal shot of innovating with us around our service as the larger partners you see on the, on the top part of the tail, top part of the graph. You know, we, we saw ourselves winning if one developer came up with a very big idea or a bunch of developers developed apps that address specific niches that in total would be significant to the business. At Netflix, the simplest measure of significant for, for any kind of endeavor means delivering some tangible value to at least 20% of our subs in any given month. That criteria helps us maintain focus and stay small and nimble by not chasing the smaller opportunities. But that being said, what is a small opportunity for Netflix might be a relatively larger opportunity for other businesses, particularly more established businesses. Again, your mileage may vary. Hey, uh, Michael, this is David. Is, is that how you pitch that to, to management? started with the API? Yeah, basically that was, and I wouldn't say we necessarily had a pitch to management. I mean, management kind of got it, and, and when we first kind of bought, I brought up the idea of doing an API, it was something they'd already been thinking about. It was just a matter of like kind of when we attacked it. So it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was any one person came up with the idea. It was something that kind of organically bubbled up, you know, within the organization. That's great. Um, so if you look at this, this picture here, uh, which is, the per app percentage of the total monthly active API-enabled app users. So on the x-axis here, we have like numbered out the, the biggest app to the smallest app, and this is just a few months after we launched the API. And the left was that app's share of all API-enabled app users. Um, and as you can see in the distribution, the long tail didn't really materialize. Um, furthermore, and it's not shown here, the total value delivered didn't come close to our 20% bar. So while 
the top app had 80% of all um, app users with any for any users using any API enabled app. The, the total uh, didn't hit our 20% bar. And and given the, the rate of growth, it was it was going to take a while to get there, especially when you consider how fast Netflix is growing its subscriber base in general. So it's, it's definitely a moving target for us. Uh, for those who don't know, our subscriber base grew about 70% just in this last year. Um, the most popular apps weren't all that innovative in terms of scenarios, big ideas. They just delivered some of our existing scenarios to device form factors that it wasn't efficient for us to reach. Uh, mobile applications were the most successful, but they were just delivering existing Netflix website scenarios, like our search recommendations. And and, and why, why did this dynamic exist? Well, there is a varied implementation technology in these different clients, you know, C, C sharp, and subjective C, and unclear sub rate reach. Um, it 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 would have been costly in both real and opportunity cost for Netflix to experiment with those platforms. So we didn't go there, um, and external developers basically filled that void. Um, but even with that bright spot, overall subscription usage, subscriber usage, wasn't high enough to justify the API program alone. So then something interesting happened. Um, you know, at this time, we were already on a, a few devices, uh, a few streaming devices with our streaming service, including Xbox. And, and Xbox approached us for ideas for the, the V2 version of the Netflix application. Um, we were already seeing signs that streaming device reach in general was a big driver for our business. But up until this point, our streaming device apps didn't support the discovery of, of movie and TV titles. And we weren't really sure we could do this well when considered the constraints of you know, smaller screen resolutions, you know, a device that's essentially across the room for you, at least, you know, we call them 10-foot UIs, they're usually 10 feet or more away, and remote control input devices, which, you know, are usually left, around, left right, up, down, and, and select. Um, up to this point, we delivered our streaming application to partners via a C-based Linux application. It was supported by a client SDK, which in turn was supported by private APIs, separate from the public API we're talking about here today. A, a partner app couldn't be built directly against this API. A minor extension to the API required a whole new API version and SDK, and they had to be integrated into this reference application. And importing the app and SDK to a non-Linux platform like Xbox also took extra time for our partners. So, you know, when we came up with new new features to roll into that stack, it took at least a quarter to roll out the new scenarios. Our private API plus client SDK didn't have anything new to offer um, above what we did to Xbox beyond what we've done in the V1 application. But, you know, so we took a step back and, you know, thought about, have we learned something from our Flowers and Flowers experiment? But what we learned was that the REST-based open API, since it was just an API, um, yeah, server side, could be revved more quickly, and we knew that it was easy for a variety of different platforms to integrate with it because there was no, you know, client assumptions built into it. Um, it already had a brand new recommendations API targeted at, at supporting new instant watching movie choices. Um, the, the first version was something we call Lolomo, which is a list of lists of movies. It had a bunch of uh, different lists of movies with targeted genres for each subscriber based upon their movie taste. So, so we basically made the decision to let Xbox integrate with that public API in order to get that functionality. And the streaming, uh, the amount of streaming on the Xbox once that application went out went up very noticeably. And and that was kind of huge for us. I mean, it was like, wow, you know, we can move the needle on uh, in helping people discover movies on devices, and that can be a driver for our business. And hey, this API delivery model helps us stay agile. So so that was a very exciting development, but that put a big question mark in the thousand flower stretch. Um, and here's why. One, we have rights restrictions on streaming titles, which demanded that they be delivered only within Netflix branded applications. Netflix branded applications demanded an application certification process to ensure a quality experience for our subscribers. Unlike third party applications, say powered by Netflix or enabled by Netflix, our name was on the app, which meant we couldn't simply disable it. It was a disappointing experience for our subscribers or use the API inefficiently. However, the instant watching device reach have proven to be a major driver for our business, and the attach rate per Netflix app was much higher than it was for any third-party app to stop a Netflix brand. So that was an opportunity beyond the constraints I just described. 
Couple that with the possibility of increased viewing per device, and it became possible to move to kind of a more advanced set of metrics than that 20% subscriber share number I mentioned earlier. So things like subscriber acquisition, subscriber retention, and lower distribution costs for us due to streams now sub substituting for disk shipment by subscribers. So, so we achieved fantastic success accelerating the rollout of proven app scenarios quickly across branded Netflix applications. API gave us the flexibility to deliver to not only that kind of C Linux app platform that we hit with our kind of initial play, but also Flash applications and more. Uh, it also now supported a variety of development approaches. Uh, so we could build the app ourselves as Netflix um, and using the API. We could have a vendor do it, or we could have a partner do it as well. And it, it worked well in all cases because each of those scenarios, the developer, Netflix vendor or partner, had equal access to our server time. Barriers there. Because it's kind of built you know, for the lowest common denominator scenario of a, of a public, you know, uh, an external third party developer. The flexibility in both client platform reach and development approaches help us deliver these new scenarios very quickly to all three major game consoles, the top 10 brands and TV and Blu ray players. And the picture I showed here is from May. Um, we're actually now on over 200 different devices at retail. So you can call this, this phase of our API strategy hundreds of devices. So at this point, our investment in the API had clearly paid off. We had over 60% of our subs um, streaming last quarter, and we're also realizing significant per subscriber streaming increases, albeit some percentage of, these, of the devices out there are PC devices, but I can tell you we're, we're well beyond that old 20% point. But having achieved this kind of you know, TV device reach, what would we do next? So, you know, mobile was the next frontier for us, having reached this critical mass of TV-connected devices. And, you know, in parallel to thinking about mobile, we were also investigating the promise of using HTML5 and a JavaScript stack for our device application. And HTML5 offered a number of potential benefits. One, it delivered compelling device experiences with visual effects that didn't make you feel like you were on a PC website. You know, think about the user expectations on TV devices. You know, the, the application you probably interact most on a television device, program guide. And the type of performance you get with the native applications and local data you know, is, is much more performant than, say, loading a web page on a, on a low-powered you know, TV device, right? Uh, on game consoles, the bar is, is definitely much higher. Um, if you think about mobile, most native apps trump web apps with similar functionality. Um, so despite the outsourcing of some innovations through programs like the API and the Netflix Prize, we also do a fairly good job of innovating on Netflix. So innovation through iteration on our website um, is done through two-week site updates. So that's another dynamic we have going. So a web-delivered UI gave us the power to completely control our experience and partner devices. And we don't have to incur the release delays associated with, say, the iPhone App Store um, approval process or other device partner application approval or certification processes, since the updates, the HTML content are very low risk compared to native code updates. So the iPhone app we show here is basically a browser shell for an HTML UI with extensions for DRM video playback. Clear technology in a browser shell loading up an HTML5 UI delivered by Netflix. Now, if you kind of play this out to logical conclusion, it could mean the end of the API usage for delivering Netflix device experiences at some point in the future. The, the, the reason being that you can generate server-generated HTML web pages that don't really need a publicly accessible you know, API. But the server-generated web pages couldn't achieve the performance goals we've had for these applications without leveraging AJAX heavily. Consider, for example, a two-dimensional grid of movie recommendations. Only part of the grid is visible at any time, and off-screen titles can be loaded incrementally. Ajax technique. API responses are also smaller network payloads than downloaded HTML. So the API gave us exactly what we needed to also build these new great Ajax-powered HTML5 experiences. And guess what? You know, the most compelling mobile platforms like iPhone and Android lead in HTML5 browser penetration. In fact, unlike on a PC, it's only HTML5 browsers on those platforms, so you don't have to worry about 
cross browser compatibility concerns. Do I need to support IE6 in parallel to HTML5 on a device? So we can now leverage the API effectively for the aforementioned device applications plus a Netflix delivered web based user on HTML5 enabled mobile device. But we didn't stop at mobile. So what if instead of implementing our UI natively on these TV devices, we brought WebKit to the party instead? So not only do we update service features rapidly on two-week release cycles, all new features or even incremental enhancements to existing features undergo rigorous A-B testing, involving different user experiences being tested in parallel with distinct groups of users. Hammock can control set of users using kind of default user experience. The only practical way to assure that new experiences are indeed better than their predecessors and not simply outperforming them due to other external factors like seasonality, content license deals, et cetera. And we've been employing these techniques on our website experience for years, and that's what's made our website experience what it is today. So when we launched our PS3 app a few weeks back, we've been testing four different app experiences concurrently. And once an API support scenario has been rapidly developed and tested on one or more HTML5 applications, be finalized and then be leveraged in other less updatable apps. Um, so that last phase we might call tons of tests. So let's talk about agility versus stability. So you know, once your API starts supporting this kind of rapid product innovation, you know, it, it, you know, it, it, our program has now moved from a world where we have interesting functionality and we expose it to the outside world to one where new features are first realized on top of the API. Um, in this role, you have to ensure that these rapidly developed APIs supporting these test experiences for just thousands of test users don't affect the stability of API supporting you know, 17 million other users. So how do you balance these competing goals? Um, and, and actually, you don't have to choose between the two. So we have a notion of provisional APIs that are one tactic for addressing this tension. So since two features are tested on platforms, HTML5 platforms, with easily updatable client code, Provisional APIs can be developed for a test scenario and then deprecated or modified for creating stable APIs post-testing that can be used by a wider range of clients as well as external developers. The test client can then be managed, can be updated to manage these changes if necessary. So they, they feel a little bit of pain of evolving APIs. But, you know, and also I should say these provisional APIs can also be deployed and operated on different server clusters in the stable APIs minimizing the chance of less tested or rapidly developed code being tested by thousands of users from potentially destabilizing services being used by millions of other users. Apogee's gateway allows you to easily route incoming API traffic to enable this kind of partitioning between the two APIs that are under development and the more stable features. So as I mentioned, this, this third evolution of the Netflix API strategy can solve tons of tests. While any potential competitor will have to work hard to just get our device to reach, We'll be accelerating our, our business and our user experience innovation on top of our API. Hey, Mike. This is David again. Uh, quick question, because we get a lot of customers that ask us about um, how to do um, multi-device strategy. And if I heard what you're saying correctly, that really the API for you guys is the foundation of kind of both, right? It's your new HTML5 client app strategy, uh, as well as supports can you talk about what the mix is? Yeah, so the HTML5 is, is very new. You will only find it today on the PlayStation and iPhone. Um, but we fully expect that that to become the standard in the coming years. And we're, we're kind of pushing in a lot of ways by, like, for example, um, we put a WebKit build on the PlayStation to support our app. And eventually maybe that'll, something like that will become more mainstream for platform. Um, the native applications are here now. And what's, what's great about is we don't have to choose between the two. We can kind of innovate on the more rapid client and the more stable. We can hand it off to a partner who has you know, longer release cycles and maybe only updates the app you know, once, if ever. And we don't have to worry about getting in something that's maybe a little too new and too in the edge that we have to deprecate or change that will destabilize those, those uh, apps that are on less nimble client platforms. I think that's a, that's a great lesson for a lot of folks that are looking at So, you know, in closing on, on the evolution, to recap, you know, the 1,000 flowers strategy with the long tail developers, it's still a question mark for us. 100 devices, um, 
going very well. Tons of tests, also going very well, just, you know, a couple months in. And as Daniel will talk to you next, I think there's a lot of interesting other, you know, things that come with the API as well. So with that, um, I'll, I'll close this by saying, you know, developing an effective API strategy is a journey, not just a single project. You need to attack, you know, attack it with the idea that you're building an asset here that's going to carry with you through a lot of different strategy evolutions. It's definitely a journey. Um, so, you know, be prepared to evolve. So, with that, I'll hand it off to Daniel, and he's going to talk about the future that here at Netflix. Thank you, Mike. Um, so, as Mike said, um, it's a it's a journey, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the journey going forward. Um, uh, the first thing I wanted to highlight is that um, everything that Mike talked about, the foundation that was laid um, up till now, has uh, been tremendously successful for us as a company, and um, you know that that has basically translated into over 10 billion requests in the month of November, with peaks at about 10,000 requests per second. Um, so that that demonstrates the value of the API to the company and the scale that we've built in place here. Uh, but to get to where we we are today, we've um, experienced a lot of changes, and uh, among those changes, you know, some of them have been very fundamental changes to the business or architecture. Um, but there have also been a, a series of tactical changes. Um, some of the changes themselves, uh, you know, Mike mentioned the hundreds of devices that we've implemented. Um, we have done a migration from a data center to the cloud, which is nearly complete. And we introduced a streaming only plan, which is uh, you know, going well both in the states and also expanded out to Canada. So these are some of the more um, fundamental business type changes. And we've we've also, um, you know, DVDs are still very important to us, but the streaming only is uh, is a big change as well. Can I ask a, this is David again. Can I ask you a question on that? Did did the was the the change in the business plan for the streaming only was that kind of a a, a premeditated thing, or did you actually change? Product offering based on the success that you were seeing. Uh, you take on the streaming device side of it. Do you, do you get what I'm asking? Yeah. Um, well, one thing we do know is that like recreating the postal operations being done in the United States has definitely been challenging, right? In other countries, and may not be as easy as it, it wasn't easy here. I can't imagine being easier anywhere else, right? right. Um, and you know, DVD will have its own maturity curve, and and you know, at some point, you know, it's going to be that popular anymore. So transitioning to streaming only is we had to do at some point, and and others smarter than me decided that was something that it was, it was time to do at, at, at now here at Netflix. That's great. Okay, so um, with all those changes that we experienced, um, we were doing this in very rapid time constraints uh, under a lot of business pressure, um, and you know, basically keeping up with the hundreds of devices that are coming out. Um, we need to make sure that we were supporting the business needs. And that resulted in some growing pains as we uh, got to where we are today. But now we're actually blessed with an opportunity to uh, get back to thinking about the future. The first step in that process is going to be going back to the drawing board. So we're going to um, start this process of going back to the drawing board with key goals. Um, some of which I, I have here, and, and Mike talked a little bit about that that balance of uh, scalability and stability against agility. Um, those are clearly some of the things that we're going to be focusing on. Uh, the resiliency of the system, making sure that we can uh, maintain uptime, uh, things like that, while we're continually to evolve the product in very rapid ways. We don't want to sacrifice our innovation and our ability to um, to get to as many devices as quickly as possible and to experiment with them. That's always going to be a challenge. And along the way, we want to um, find ways to simplify everything that we're doing so that interfaces into the API, the way that we're delivering content, can result in low transactions, uh, low number of transactions, um, you know, lower payloads, things like that, so that um, the whole thing can be much more efficient. So um, one example of that is when you look at that number of 10 billion um, Ten plus billion. Uh, in a lot of ways, that's a very impressive number. One of my charters might be to make that smaller, so that we can be more efficient. You know, 
you need five transactions to load this page as opposed to you know, two and two. I expect that that number is going to grow over time with the, the scale of the company, but it's my charter to try and um, get things more efficient. So um, following slides are going to be a series of ideas. You know, as we're thinking about the future, we're, we're kind of um, brainstorming on some concepts on what we think might apply for the future of the API, and you know, we're still in the research phase. But I'm um, going to share some of those ideas, um, keeping in mind that uh, a lot of um, a lot of these ideas are continue to evolve. Some of them are going to kind of drop off the radar. Some of them eclipsed by others, and um, you know, we're just going to continue to evolve what we're thinking. Like Mike said, it's a, it's, this whole process is a journey, so uh, you know we're always going to be taking the ideas. Um, seriously and constantly uh, looking in the mirror. So um, we talked a little bit before about the thousand flowers idea where each of those red dots um, represents uh, a flower. Um, and when we launched the API originally, um, that was the model. Um, and then over time we evolved the API, we morphed it to basically be a multi-support system where we're supporting internal development as well as these flowers. And there are there is some division of operations, but um, because of the rapid development time timeline, uh, you know, it's kind of morphed in this way. So one of the ideas that we're thinking about is is evolving. Evolving it to a model that is a little cleaner, is more representative of our our business. That is that we have um, a series of devices that we need to support and that we need Evolve, and that's actually our core business. We want to target our APIs towards those um, that, that part of our business, but not to the exclusion of the public. So um, we want to create this model where we're developing towards um, the way the business is going, and then have a trickle-down effect so that features uh, will make it down to the public. Um, this will have two values for us. One, it's going to improve our ability to focus on the, the key aspects of what we're doing. Um, and it also is going to keep the public more closely aligned to what we're doing because they're going to be getting feature sets that we're actually continuing to develop rather than being uh, an ancillary version or off to the side. Another thing we want to look at is um, hiding some of our internal business dependencies from our consumers. Um, if you look at the API request response model uh, today, it's kind of like a one-to-one -one or one-to-two model where we have dependent systems under the sky and their corresponding interfaces uh, sitting on top of those where the interface might be somewhat distinct or partially distinct um, from others that may be similar. So, for example, rental history and queue, those have different outputs uh, from the API, but in essence they're kind of all just lists. We want to review all of that and see if there are opportunities to consolidate those different kinds of lists into one generic list that uh, an interface, uh, possibly with extensions to the extent that they're different. Um, but basically, we want to simplify the model to the extent that we can so that um, our internal consumers and the public uh, API consumers can have an easier way into the system without having um, queries or unique uh, uh, response formats deal with on the way out. We also want to review the underlying architecture, and Mike talked a bit about this, this concept of the provisional APIs. Um, we, want to, we want to review this and, and formalize some of it, um, that we have different tiering uh, to break out the different functions of the API. So um, on the far left there, um, those are basically our dependent systems underneath the API that uh, apply ratings or recommendations or um, queue or account information, things like that. Those systems offer services to the API team, um, basically ways for the API to get that material uh, so that we can do things with it and supply it out to the users. I want to uh, introduce this normalization and resiliency layer, which in essence is going to take that material that we're getting from our services and normalize it so that we can provide that unified list format uh, 
Right now, we're kind of typing them out individually. Um, we're doing some normalization, but we, we want to consider op opportunities um, more normalized, more simple. And at the same time, this is an opportunity to possibly create some caching instances or, or other layers that will uh, basically insulate us from possible failures from our dependencies in maintaining maximum uptime. And so the next layer is essentially what I'm calling the pure API layer. Um, it's uh, one step above the normalization, but this is an access point directly into the it is um, really simple and uh, fundamental. And uh, the way I see it is that these APIs are going to change very infrequently. So they can be considered fundamental. They're not going to be um, uh, changing under people's feet. Um, and to the extent that they do change, they're most often going to be changed in uh, additive ways. So we're adding fields, uh, extending the model. We're not necessarily removing fields or changing the way fields operate. So because of that, we can keep this as a foundation to everything else we're going to do. The next two tiers are for rapid, uh, rapid development and the agility we're trying to achieve. Um, they may actually turn out to be theoretical layers, um, but and you know some devices may actually implement them. Not. We don't know how this is going to pan out yet. The idea here is that. Um, we have the foundational APIs there. Uh, this is an opportunity, the shared layer, um, for multiple devices or multiple outputs to have shared feature sets that interface with the fundamental APIs in such a way that um, we, they can be leveraged across platforms. So, for example, um, if we want all of the, play, uh, the gaming consoles to be treated the same, we can have a shared utility that sits on top of the foundation. And they can all take advantage of that without Affecting any of the pipeline for the iPhone app, or um, for example, uh, another another idea there is you know if all the Apple products need the same features. And the final layer is really the rapid development layer, and um, again this this could be a theoretical layer. We may implement. We have to see how this is going to play out, but um, the idea is that each device could potentially get its own implementation that sits on top of the stack. That implementation could be used for heavy experimentation, A-B testing, uh, device-specific implementation, things like that. Um, and the idea here is that um, if the iPhone app gets a, a wrapper that's on top of the stack, um, it, you know, making those changes to that wrapper um, means that we can test just that area of the code, just that device, without compromising the Xbox, for example. Um, and to the extent that those experiments or tests uh, show success, we can push that feature set down the stack so that others can leverage it. But um, the idea here, again, that Mike was talking about before for um, stability and agility, this kind of model is trying to uh, facilitate that where the foundation is the stability and, um, and the foundation that everything sits on, and the wrapper layer is really for the innovation and the agility. And of course, the final layer here is the devices themselves. Uh, it's not represented here, but one of the uh, one of the outputs there is also the public API. Another concept that we're exploring is um, we want our API request to be as flexible as SQL, and uh, that doesn't mean that we want a SQL interface uh, of that nature. What it means is that I, any question that I might have for our data set that I can achieve with SQL, I want to see if we can match that with our API. Um, so for example, partial response so that we can limit loads and say we only want to build um, joining tables or joining APIs, for example, um, limiting result sets by date ranges, ordering them, uh, you know, things of that nature. We really want to um, be able to handle all of those questions um, as they come in. And one of the things uh, that is really powerful about this is we don't know exactly what the business six months from now, I don't necessarily want to have to predict that, but if I have a, a system that can handle a very flexible request like this, uh, I, there's a reasonable chance that I won't have to refactor or modify my code to support this as we go forward. So uh, right now our system is versioned. Um, we're starting to see the possibility of some issues with versioning. Uh, 
Um, so for example, we have 1.0, 1.5, 2.0. Um, we can imagine a 3.0, a 4.0, 5.0, and, and going. Um, and you know, that's a perfectly viable route to go for some businesses. Uh, what I want to do is I want to look at that to see if same goals that we have. And one of the challenges I see is um, you know, if we have some underlying dependency that needs to change fundamentally to our system, we might have to apply that to n number of branches of our code to support that. And um, then, of course, we have to test that. We have to keep track of all the devices and which versions they're using. Um, and we already have matrix matrices detailing you know, those versions relative to the 200 devices, and I can tell you right now it's already kind of tough to consume. So it's only going to get uh, worse over time. And when you consider the devices that we're talking about, uh, you know, TVs in people's houses, you know, people don't turn over TVs every month, uh, and we might not have an opportunity to to modify the firmware or, or you know do any kinds of updates to that. So we may be stuck. With a, an API version like a 1.0 for seven to ten years, commissioning any of these files, and of course the matrix will just get even more complicated. So uh, maybe we don't need versioning. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, the next phase of the API as a single pipe, and um, we see opportunity with that foundational API layer, your APIs. Um, because we're not going to be swapping out from the system, uh, we're really just going to be doing additive type things. We may not be able to, we may not need to version those. Um, and as we get further up the pipe to the wrapper layer, we may have some versioning happening there, but that's device specific and um, by and large going to be internal and under our control. And, um, so this is something that we're going to explore. We don't know how it's going to end up. Um, and another element of this is if, in fact, our uh, future API does result in fundamental changes that we have to version, we can always branch it to someone else. If I start going in position, if we go this route, is to um, say, all right, our intent is to not version and try and uh, keep this. Again, we don't know where it's going to go. Uh, okay, so. Um, well, do you want to I can cover it, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. So, so for those asking how we use Mike, so that's asking how we, we version today. Uh, we still we do this, you know, one approach, which is uh, simply have the version around you know, people can have. So the default actually being say yes, yeah. And that's something we see with uh, Twitter too, right? They finally introduced a, a one in their right. Yeah, I mean, there's some we won't go into today, but there's some debates. You know, do you put that in the path part or the param, and sort of does does pass, we do param, but yeah, that's probably a good question for conversation I had today. Right, and, and then there's also the question right now is default to the oldest form of the API, default has current, and there are other routes that we could take to be stick with versioning. So, what, what you're suggesting though is, is fantastic advice for somebody who started out with the guy that's questioning. At Apogee, we get a lot too how to, how to handle that, and I think. The one thing we've seen is it takes an enormous amount of discipline to think about, okay, if I'm going to put an API out there, what do I put out that uh, five to the next five to eight years is not going to have to change? That, that really forces you to put down just the minimal, most core functionality. And then it's yeah, my philosophy generally for a versionless API has always been better to be incomplete than So withhold rather than just put it out there and expect to change. Now, if you want to go the versioning route and, and that's better, better for the business model or, you know, it's appropriate, um, go it out there, version. But, you know, that, that's something I want to explore. I think that gets a little murkier for us as we continue. Definitely great advice. Um, another question that we're going to have, I think right now, um, you know, we're pretty XML heavy. Um, Internally, a lot more of our devices are based on. I think we're roughly a 50-50 split or so. Um, the question is, okay, what is our preferred format? Um, is it XML based on something else? Do we want to treat them both uh, equally? Um, another idea is, um, you know, if we can get to a model where the output format is incidental and 
ramping up new transforms, and then uh, that's probably the best route or the one we're going to explore as well. And so uh, REST, um, we like REST, but we're not indicating here with this slide that we're going to try and uh, you know, create a new convention or anything like that. We're going to try to adhere to the REST. Um, this is something that we believe in, that, uh, you know, it's a very good convention. Um, the one caveat is uh, we just don't want to do that at the expense of our business. So if the business um, pushes us in a certain direction, it requires us to break rest convention. I don't want to just adhere to the convention because it's the convention at the expense of the business. And I don't anticipate that happening, but I wanted to throw that out there as, um, uh, you know, basically our goal is to best serve needs of the business. We think REST will get us there, but if not, we want to um, focus on the business needs. So with that, um, those are some of the ideas. Um, we're going to continue to do more, and if um, you have questions, you know, now and if I, the kind of stuff excites you and you want to talk to us about job opportunities, we have um, several on the API team and like hiring for the social team as well. So Feel free to reach out to us in which form you want. Thank you very much, Mike and Dan. We had a lot of great questions. Uh, a couple of us uh, heard more than once. Um, QA, uh, how, do you, how do you handle uh, automate QA when you are selling or more different devices? Sure. So I can tell you that we have automation at the API level itself that, that we, we do for any API update we request the heck out of it. Um, we also do spot checking on the biggest devices we have on the primary scenario. So, so we, you know, that, that, that agility stability trade-off, we we're willing to potentially introduce a small bug in some non-primary scenario in a device to get something out quickly and then we'll quickly fix it and find the issue. But so we'll make sure, for example, that the user can and get through recommendations and get the playback without an instruction. But maybe you know, if I can't find a similar movie to the title uh, when I'm on the movie detail page, we might miss that one, and we'll and we'll fix it after rollout if necessary. And that's worked pretty well for us. With the um, with the HTML5 UI that opens up the, the possibility of doing UI level testing with automation, and haven't been able to this case. We talk about that variety of client client implementations, so that brings a lot of complexity to automation. Yeah, and that's, that's another reason that I wanted to get look more into that uh, tiered architecture model because then you can test certain areas more cleanly. Um, and you know, if we have a particular release that is going to be very heavy on a particular device, um, some of that feature set may end up in the outer layer, in the wrapper layer. In this case, um, you don't necessarily have to test the full suite of things. So I think part of it is a question around how how are we going to actually say processes, but I think part of it goes back to our architecture to take some of the pain away from the Great. Uh, another question uh, about AWS, Amazon Web Services, is any lessons learned there, uh, especially uh, uh, some of the DAS uh, auto scaling or, or uh, Yeah, I, I can say, you know, moving Amazon um, was, a, it was a big effort for us this year, but it's already paying off in, in space. Um, I think, you know, one way to point to the, the best stuff we get out of the Amazon uh, uh, world, besides the fact that we re-architected things to make them horizontally scalable. Uh, but the big thing was, for example, when we did the, I, the iPhone launch was the first launch we did 100% in the cloud without giving ourselves the luxury of falling back to our data center. We thought the day one usage was so high that we couldn't scale out our old data center. Um, so we actually um, did testing for the iPhone rollout at a pretty high level of scale based on our protective usage phase. We figured there'd be very a lot of a uh, you know a shiny new toy phenomenon, of people showing it off in the office, that kind of thing. Um, some folks have asked about tools. We actually used um, Sosa for cloud based load generation uh, to, uh, to pound the heck out of the API at a very high level of usage. And that was actually turned out being to be more than enough what we needed. And the results of that testing made us feel very confident in launching all three game consoles at a higher level of usage on the API in the cloud um, within just three weeks. So, um, and EC2 gave us the ability to just turn the knob up or down on the number of instances that we had deployed at any given time uh, very easily. And that, that's a huge.
huge for our business because um, you know as much as we you know hit the space very well, we, we often have no idea how well you know the application community on a lot of these applications. So that elasticity is a, is a huge uh, benefit for the business. With regard to auto scaling, we're not using it yet at this point to dynamically scale um, answers up or down. That's something we'll probably tackle in the next six to twelve months. Um, this um, fascinating, Mike, and uh, maybe you can talk for a moment because you look, you look back at this it's been an amazingly busy year. And to me, you tell me you guys rolled out all these devices and moved to Amazon Cloud uh, all in 2010. And yeah, uh, and, and we internationalized for Canada. How did you manage all that? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, short night. Um, <laughs> So um, yeah, I, I guess we you know we we assess, I'd say the number one thing is you know, we obsess about talent density and having the best people and sharp people that are really passionate about the business and that's the most you know the best asset you can have. Cloud scares the elasticity. Um, the actually the Apogee's um, ServiceNet gateway helps out a lot um, as we are managing that migration. We what I could do is like basically at any one point in time I had nine different applications under development. Uh, and I had about nine different dependencies, as Daniel showed, um, all moving to cloud at the same time. So we had to manage all that complexity, and and I, you know I, I didn't want it for those nine dependencies. I had to think about the nine applications. So as a new dependency popped up in the cloud, we could use the, the service, I believe, the FG gateway, sorry, to basically move just that particular service from data center to cloud. So at any point in time, you had a completely coherent API, but day to day, some of the backend services could be running in the data center or in the cloud. And, that definitely helps a lot. But uh, you know, Daniel talked about the 10 billion number uh, plus number for November. Um, just in August, end of August, we were at like three and a half. So just humongous growth in the last few months alone. Mm -hmm. That is just a fantastic thing. Yeah, I just had a couple more questions before we go. Yeah, there was a, a great question about uh, the, the wrapper. The, the the wrapper layer that uh, in the architecture slide you showed. Did you are those all inherently developed in the or did you open source or other other ways to uh, build that library out? Well, it's not this. This is a concept that we're going to explore. So uh, you know, be determined. But um, I mean, this is primarily going to be satisfying. Uh, I think the goal would be to satisfy internal uh, interactions with our partners or our products or whatever else. Um, open sourcing the code, we hadn't talked about that. If it's useful, we could talk about that. I don't know. I don't know where that would go. Um, but really the target would be, are there specific things that we want to achieve on the Xbox? Um, and um, do we want to introduce those in the foundational layer or do we want to experiment push it out a layer? There, um, you know, there's another interesting question out here too, and like, I don't know if you um, can talk about this a little bit. Because I know uh, when Twitter acquired uh, Tweety um, this last year, um, you know there was a pretty big impact on the developer community. And, um, you know, there's a question here asking about, you know, did you guys increase your support for small developers since the uh, uh, Thousand Flower strategy didn't really pan out? Can you kind of give your perspective on how you see uh, the small developers and how you support them and what the impact on building your own name uh, apps are versus what the Sure. I mean, I, I can say, honestly, say we, we, did, we did decrease the support for the external development community somewhat as we made the shift. Um, you know, partially just because of focus and team size and everything else we had going on this year, right? Um, but, you know, there was the documentation out there was out there, the APIs are out there, so maybe certain questions in the forums didn't get answered. Well, we're, we're pretty good about answering forum questions, but. A, you know, 24 hour turnaround. I mean, that turned into a couple days turnaround, right? Um, also, how quickly we get the APs out to the external help to me and slow down a little bit. But that's something that, you know, Daniel's hiring more people on the team. That's obviously something that we need more bandwidth, you know, the types of things we tackle. Um, I also know anecdotally that, you know, and I, I think just when you talk about Twitter, I mean, the open developer, you know, opportunity is definitely something that you guys face. Twitter, you know, acquired Tweety, but there's a bunch of other mobile, you know, apps that for Twitter that didn't get acquired. There's a bunch of Netflix mobile apps that we came out with their own, and I know the use of those decreased when our own 
text came out. So, you know, I think I think there's an opportunity of an honest dialogue about you know, what the opportunity is for these developers. I mean, you know, from my perspective, you know, there's a range of, of payoffs for a developer, everything from like you know, cash to just scratching an itch and that you want a scenario to get realized or maybe a little exposure, right? So, you know, I, I think the, the best case scenario is either acquired by Tweety and or you something like I don't know maybe like a clicker you know dot com who integrates the API but it's only part of what they do and it that enables new opportunities in their own revenue streams independent of say Netflix subscriber acquisition boundaries right so um, I think those are probably the biggest opportunities and and the few get there um, and everybody else it's like hopefully you're getting something in terms of exposure or people knowing that you just have you know bad coding skills or or just the, the self-satisfaction of, hey, I'm the first to enable it on you know, some kind of device, right? Um, but yeah, it's, I, I don't think we should delude folks that you know every open developer is going to have a big payday at the end of the day. It's a lot of challenge. That's great advice. And, and one of the things I wanted to mention was the, the slide of um, separating out the internal and trickle down of the features. Um, and I think that you know if we set up this architecture correctly, um, that trickle down of features could be actually a much more robust pipeline publicly, hopefully, if we're doing it right. Um, the idea there is that it, it probably it, it could be more around access control. That these kinds of things are restricted for public because they're really proprietary or you know they're rights encumbrances or something like that. Um, and uh, so hopefully, um, they're much more the public kind of more integrated in the kind of things because as we evolve the business, we're going to get trickle down. But, but the like, things like licensing do create challenges. That's about trailers. You know, we have those actually available in the API, but they're you know they're just for epic right application. As we come to the end of the hour here, I guess are there any more lessons learned on uh, the topics we've been thinking from like the uh, product managing API versus a, a web property or uh, analytics? Great blog entries in your case with NPR on the sports analytics. Uh, so it's a great question about whether you guys drive the internal things through the dog food <laughs> a, a, API. Yeah, well, it, it, the, the internal teams do use the API, our generation on five apps. Um, there's some, you know, beginnings of discussions about our website as well, especially for Ajax scenarios. Guys don't readily support. Um, in, in terms of the analytics, um, one of the things that here in Netflix and that I've written about in the past is that uh, ultimately the value proposition of the API is not about that number that's out there in the West. Right? That's kind of a, a proxy for other kinds of things and the real metric that we're going to care about is the uh, number of viewing hours or you know, number of uh, video starts or whatever it is. It's something about how users are consuming um, and so how developers, whether they're internal or external, uh, how they're interacting with the API directly. You know, those are interesting metrics that help to gauge um, scalability and you know ramping up cloud instances and things like that. Or um, you know maybe it also is an indicator of efficiency in the transactions for a given page load or whatever else. Um, but that's not really telling the story about how we're moving forward. So this is Mike. I think I think some of the most interesting things in the board are around service quality. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing about an API gateway, you know, guys, is the gateway to all your other services. So you know it's a it's a control point, so you, you have a good sense of how well the API is performing, as well as how everything behind you is performing, and how, how how available they are. So, depending on the sophistication of the, the 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 service quality analytics around all those systems, you can typically provide some insights that a lot of your partners, internal partners, might not even have. That's a great point. I think that's that's a great one to end on, and uh, I think that. Uh, Posted in the chat room that uh, there'll be a recording of this made available uh, very soon, and we'll be sending it to everybody in a follow-up email. Uh, obviously, everybody wants to thank uh, you guys, Mike and Dan, for taking the time and walking us through this. It's a great story, it's great content. Thank you, guys. It was great talking to everyone. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you guys too. Thank you for an excellent show today. I can tell that everyone appreciated it very much. I
I also want to thank Apogee, the, uh, today's sponsor, and I want to thank everyone who joined in the webcast today and put up with us through the difficulties of last time and was willing to come back this time. So we had a great crowd and excellent questions. Thank you so much. Um, I will get the link to the recording out to you in a very short time, possibly a day or so. Got it? So thanks again. Goodbye.